family. Yeah. And then there are people waiting in the wings to clamp down on that. You're being sexist. You're being derogatory towards women by referencing their role in a family. You've been yeah. scapegoated by the left, some could argue, once described, I think, as, how was it, a pseudo-intellectual hero to the incel community. Yeah, yeah that's a good, that was a pretty good line, that yeah, one. I mean, yeah. But what's your reaction to those sorts of criticisms, which must be very hurtful? Well, they were hurtful for a good while, but after a while they just sort of became comical because they just got more and more absurd. Look, every category has a, an ideal at the center and a margin at the fringe. And if the center is destroyed, the margin will be demolished as well. Now, the radicals think that you can bring the margin to the center, but that's preposterous because a margin is a plurality. And if you bring the plurality to the center, you demolish, the, you demolish everything. You demolish the category. Well, look, if you have the nuclear family as the minimal ideal, obviously you simultaneously exclude to some degree those people who aren't in that constellation. But if you destroy the constellation itself, everyone disappears. So I'll give you an example. So we had LGB and then we had LGBT. Well, now the T is destroying the L and the G. And the reason for that is that the margin will devour itself. And so it might be the case that my pro-family stance marginalizes, but it's even more the case that the stance that says any old thing goes destroys absolutely everything. And you're naive to think that that's not the case. And I think that what's happening, 80% of the kids who undergo, at least before this recent explosive epidemic, on the female side, 80% of the kids who are undergoing gender transformation surgery unnecessarily are gay. Mm. Right. Well, that's a classic stellar example of what happens when the margin takes the center. The margin can't take the center. Now, so that brings up a real problem, which the leftists point out to is like, how do you have a category, say, with the family, the nuclear family as the minimal ideal, without being prejudiced against other people? And it's something like um, an informed and humble tolerance. You know, like, there's divorce in my immediate family, you know, and certainly in my extended family. My sister's been divorced, my brother's been divorced, my daughter's been divorced. Every family has people in it who are single or who are widowed or, or who are in gay relationships. I mean, the family is an ideal that's breached more than it's adhered to, but that doesn't mean you get to sacrifice the ideal. No. The ideal still has to stay. And then we have to live with the tension between the ideal and the, the fragments that that surround it, that actually yeah. make up, well, even if you're in a dedicated marriage. I mean, there's been times in my marriage with my wife where our relationship was very tense. And so we've moved, we moved away from the ideal, but you don't throw out the ideal just because it's difficult to attain and because it excludes what's not ideal, because then you destroy everything. If you have no ideal, there's nothing to work for. And the notion that we can somehow move beyond the minimal nuclear family, I just don't think there's any evidence for that whatsoever. And I would also say that when contemplating that, we might want to look at those who are truly the most vulnerable and victimized, and the ones who are most vulnerable and victimized by the breakdown of the nuclear family are 100% children. It's plain mm -hmm. and absolutely simple. Children without fathers, for example, do way worse, way worse. And that the, if, 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 if the... Hi guys, welcome back to my YouTube channel. So if you are new here, please subscribe to my YouTube channel. So today I'm reacting to Multiculturalism is a miracle of stupidity, stupidity by Jordan Peterson. So guys, please let's watch this video together. Poof! Jordan, lovely to see you. Thank you for your time today. Um, you've spoken about trying to tilt the world towards heaven and away from hell. Are you saying that we're headed to hell in a handcart? And is the decline of Western civilization reversible, do you think? Well, those always exist as possibilities, and we all know that in our own lives, because you know that things can go badly or they can go well. And you also know that you have some relationship with that, because you know that if you continue the pattern of dreadful mistakes that you're inclined to make that you could stop making if you wanted to, that things could get very bad for you and likely have at different points in your life. And so those realities are always set out ahead of us. 
and the notion of heaven and hell are the you could think about those those notions as the ultimate reaches of those possibilities you know and we never fully inhabit an archetypal hell but i would say auschwitz came close yes. you know it was close enough for me and then with regard to heaven well you know you inhabit that now and then when i think the easiest pathway to what's meant classically by heaven is often to, to be found in love especially in relationship with children yes you know you see when 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 i had my, my wife and i had my daughter we lived in a pretty poor area in montreal and we used to push her around in a cart and as you do with babies and one of the wonderful things to see was that even the roughest street guys would you could see the best in them if they weren't completely obliterated by their lives you know you could see them light up and that light well that's you know the ultimate extension of that light is heaven and we make choices that move us in one direction or the other all the time and the way that society unrolls itself is a consequence of those choices and and in a much more direct way than people tend to think so are we doomed to an apocalyptic nightmare no more than we have been in the past although perhaps faster now because of the rate of technological transformation i don't think that things have to be i don't think it's ever the case that things have to move in a hellish direction but they sure could so but life feels a bit hellish at the moment if you think about the war in ukraine recent events in israel we've had a lot of divisiveness on the streets of london in yeah. recent days and weeks do you think that there's a way of reversing the sort of tribalism associated with say identity politics mm -hmm. well we're we're experimenting with how to do that on a large scale this week here in london so at the conference that that's occurring around us and do i think it's possible to reverse it i think it's always possible to reverse it i mean look the soviet russia dumped the soviet union you know and maybe you're not very happy with russia at the moment but they did decide that that totalitarian experiment was inappropriate we locked ourselves down miserably for two years absolutely pointlessly toying with totalitarianism copying china in essence very rapidly but we decided that maybe that wasn't such a good idea and backed off and so i don't think things are ever set so miserably that there's no hope mm. so and certainly i don't think that's the case with the world right now because the horizon of opportunity that's in front of us is at least as vast as the horizon of catastrophe and i would say vaster because i think in the final analysis good triumphs over evil i think it's more powerful in the final analysis that truth is more powerful than falsehood virtually by definition although we do live in this post-truth world i mean we've seen around some of the debate around israel this week of people perpetuating falsehoods. We also live in this society now where the prevailing attitude is, if you don't agree with me, then you're not just wrong, but you're a bigot mm -hmm. and a racist mm -hmm. and deserve to be canceled. Mm -hmm. So- Or worse. Or worse. So I think there's a perception that Western governments particularly have been weak on woke. <laughs> They've yeah. been weak on the so-called tolerance who are actually extremely intolerant. Mm -hmm. How does the silent majority cope with this? Well, usually often, too often, perhaps by putting their head in the sand. I mean, that's certainly the case in my country because it's taken multiple dismal turns for the worst in the last eight years. But it's led the liberals there, were led by a very charismatic leader who's extraordinarily narcissistic and who's used compassion. Look, if you're really narcissistic and manipulative, the best disguise is compassion. And you can get very good at acting that out. And if you're very good at it, it's very hard to stand against you because your constant excuse is, well, I'm just doing this for the good of someone else, not only for, for the good of someone else, but for the good of the most oppressed and suffering. Yes. You know, and if you're good at that, it's very hard to, first of all, it's very hard to be suspicious enough to actually detect the magnitude of that lie. And second, it's hard to stand against it without easily being tarred and feathered as a bigot. You know, when I, when I first came to some political trouble, let's say in Canada in 2016, I spoke up against a bill that I thought was an unwarranted intrusion into the realm of free speech and free thought, which is what it was, but it was guised in the cloak of, well, we're just caring for the, the least of the lesser, which who was in this case, people confused about their sexuality and their gender, trans people, let's say, 
and the you know the immediate accusation towards me was that I was hateful and a bigot. Well, you know, it's why did you choose this hill to die on? Why, why don't you care about these poor suffering people? Can't you just use the language that would make them feel better? And then if you are also, you know, why are the governments weak on that sort of thing? Look, I talk to conservatives and classic liberals all over the Western world, individual by individual. And although this is starting to change to some degree, they're all terrified of being torn apart by the yes. bloodthirsty mob. And no wonder. But then that suggests that politicians may have lost their courage. And I'm wondering what your analysis is of Rishi Sunak. No, Sunak's the mob just got more effective. Well, maybe. Yeah, but yeah. you've met with some conservative MPs this week. Yeah. I mean, has Rishi Sunak's conservatism lost its way? Well, he inherited a mess, to, you know, to be fair. And Bo how Boris Johnson got enticed down the net zero road is just beyond me. I think it probably had something to do with his young wife, you know. But he swallowed hook, line, and sinker the apocalyptic narrative that implied that the only way forward into the future was to decimate poor people and to make energy more polluting and 10 times as expensive, which is rather a preposterous plan, as we can see by how it's laid itself out in the UK and even more stunningly in Germany. Mm -hmm. And poor Sunak's in a position where he has to go, that looks like it was a mistake, which isn't really a glorious vision of leadership. And, I don't really know what he's supposed to do with that mess. Now, what he's been doing is rolling it back to some degree, and you might say perhaps not fast enough, and I suppose I would incline to agree with that, but by the same token, I'm glad I'm not in his shoes. What the conference here this week was designed to, to suggest, at least in part, was a broader vision than the mere vision of, oops, it looks like we made a mistake on yes. the energy and environment front. Although so, there are some conservative voices, you've just touched on this in this interview, who feel like they are mooted. You know, you hear Miriam Cates or Danny Kruger talk about the value of family. Yeah. And then there are people waiting in the wings to clamp down on that. You're being sexist, you're being derogatory towards women by referencing their role in a family. You've been yeah. scapegoated by the left, some could argue, once described, I think, as, how was it, a pseudo-intellectual hero to the incel community. Yeah, yeah that's a good, that was a pretty good line. That yeah, one, I mean, yeah. but what's your reaction to those sorts of criticisms, which must be very hurtful? Well, they were hurtful for a good while, but after a while they just sort of became comical because they just got more and more absurd. Look, every category has a, an ideal at the center and a margin at the fringe. And if the center is destroyed, the margin will be demolished as well. Now, the radicals think that you can bring the margin to the center, but that's preposterous because a margin is a plurality. And if you bring the plurality to the center, you demolish, the, demolish everything. You demolish the category. Well, look, if you have the nuclear family as the minimal ideal, obviously you simultaneously exclude to some degree those people who aren't in that constellation. But if you destroy the constellation itself, everyone disappears. So I'll give you an example. So we had LGB and then we had LGBT. Well, now the T is destroying the L and the G. And the reason for that is that the margin will devour itself. And so it might be the case that my pro-family stance marginalizes, but it's even more the case that the stance that says any old thing goes destroys absolutely everything. And you're naive to think that that's not the case. And I think that what's happening, 80% of the kids who undergo, at least before this recent explosive epidemic, on the female side, 80% of the kids who are undergoing gender transformation surgery unnecessarily are gay. Mm. Right, well, that's a classic stellar example of what happens when the margin takes the center. The margin can't take the center. Now, so that brings up a real problem, which the leftists point out to is like, how do you have a category, say with the family, the nuclear family as the minimal ideal without being prejudiced against other people? And it's something like um, an informed and humble tolerance. You know, like there's divorce in my immediate family, you know, and certainly in my extended family. My sister's been divorced, my brother's been divorced, my daughter's been divorced. Every family has people in it who are single or who are widowed. Or, or who were in gay relationships. I mean, the family is an ideal that's breached more than it's adhered to, but that doesn't mean you get to sacrifice the ideal. No. The ideal still has to stay. And then we have to live with the tension between the ideal and the, the fragments that 
that surround it that actually yeah. make up well even if you're in a dedicated marriage I mean, there's been times in my marriage with my wife where our relationship was very tense and so we moved we moved away from the ideal but you don't throw out the ideal just because it's difficult to attain and because it excludes what's not ideal because then you destroy everything if you have no ideal there's nothing to work for and the notion that we can somehow move beyond the minimal nuclear family, I just don't think there's any evidence for that whatsoever. And I would also say that when contemplating that, we might want to look at those who are truly the most vulnerable and victimized, and the ones who are most vulnerable and victimized by the breakdown of the nuclear family are 100% children. It's plain mm -hmm. and absolutely simple. Children without fathers, for example, do way worse, way worse. And that the, if, 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 if the evidence that's been accrued on that side isn't convincing to you, yeah. then no evidence about anything ever would be convincing about anything. Although the alternative view to that would be that you are stigmatizing single mothers by saying that, because actually you could have an extreme... I am stigmatizing single mothers. Is that a problem, though, if you have well, a strong and empowered woman who is bringing up yeah. a family in the absence of a father who actually maybe their absence is welcome, maybe the dad wasn't a good influence, you'd arguably be better off with the strong mother than two weak there, parents. Well, we, you, there's obviously exceptional cases sure. where the exception is the preferable alternative, Yeah. obviously. Well, that's what people, that's the decision that people make when they get divorced. You know, most people who get divorced aren't happy with it, and, but they accept the broken marriage as the, re as the reality that's preferable to the continuation of the, of the relationship. And yeah. I've certainly had couples, for example, or people in my clinical practice for whom the divorce was clearly the right alternative. Mm. And they were ma married to people who were narcissistically psychopathic, who were making their lives absolute hell. But that doesn't mean that you get to escape from the ideal without the price of stigmatization. You can do a good job as a single mother, but that doesn't make it an ideal, you certainly not a societal idea. You mentioning narcissism again. Yeah. I mean, do we think that individualism has turned into narcissism and that there is a greater prevalence of narcissism well, in Jean Twenge, society? Well, Jean Twenge has made that case. She's a quite, a, quite a good social personality psychologist. I mean, you've described Trudeau as a narcissist. Yeah. Would yeah. you describe, for instance, Harry and Meghan as narcissists? I have to tread lightly with such categorization, being a clinical psychologist. Well, you know, I'll leave myself to speculation. Well, Twenge is the best source on this, and she believes, and I think there's some truth in this, is that the hyperemphasis, for example, on the development of self-esteem at all costs in, in the education system, which was a pathology generated by the faculties of education, you know, damn their hides, has produced a more uh, a, a generation of young people who are tilted more in a narcissistic direction. And this constant insistence that you can define yourself, you know, independent of all social relationships whatsoever, and that you should pursue mm. what's hedonistically desirable at every second, come what may. Well, all of that's by definition narcissistic. Yes. So, and it's, but I think mostly what it's produced though, probably more than a, than a, what would you say, epidemic of narcissism, is that it's produced an epidemic of depression and anxiety, and Jonathan Haidt right now is writing about that. He's a famous personality and social psychologist, and a very good one, and he, he's documenting evidence. He, he spoke at this conference here this week. He's documented evidence that the typical female, the typical liberal identifying young woman in the United States is statistically more likely to have been diagnosed with a mental illness than less likely. Yes. So it's the majority. It's particularly hitting young liberal women hard. And so is that a narcissism? I think mostly it's manifesting itself in an excess of misery. There's some narcissism as well. You probably have to be tilted that way to yes. begin with, though, you know. Can I just ask you about multiculturalism? Yeah. Because we have witnessed some extraordinary scenes on the streets of London. Yeah. We've had the call for an intifada from London to Gaza. We've got a huge amount of division at the moment between some sectors of the Muslim community and Jews. Yeah. We've seen an uplift in Islamophobia and in anti-Semitism mm -hmm. in recent times. Mm -hmm. Does that suggest that multiculturalism has failed? Well, there was no such thing as multicultural philosophy. It's, it's, so, it's so puerile and what moralizing and unsophisticated that it's kind of a miracle of stupidity. I mean, first of all, we've always had a multicultural world. That's why there's been wars. 
right? So along with multiculturalism yeah. goes wars when the cultures don't get along. So what happens when you import that? Well, two things. You either import that under a unifying rubric, which would be something like the melting pot in the United States, or you retain the multicultural divisions. Okay, and you might say, well, we benefit from the diversity, which is arguably true, you know? I mean, when I came to London in the 1980s, I went to a reasonably good restaurant and I was fed canned spaghetti. You know, the food here was, to call it dismal was an absolute compliment. And so one of the benefits of multiculturalism has been a radical diversification, let's say, in, in cuisine, mm -hmm. and that's a huge benefit. But if you think you can import multitude of cultures without a unifying rubric mm -hmm. and not import the problem of interpersonal and social conflict, you're either, you're either blind or stupid or both. And both's a dreadful combination. So like, what, on what basis does multiculturalism become peace? You wave some magic wand and all of a sudden everybody gives up their cultural differences and can live in harmony? Harmony defined by what? Is there some unifying harmony? Well, if there's some unifying harmony, then multiculturalism isn't the solution. It's like unity through diversity, you know? Peace through war, mm. you know? It's a preposterous, it's a preposterous claim. It's foolish in its extreme. And so, and then when there's tension, like there is in the world now, well, you see the rifts emerge, and why wouldn't they? Especially if you're telling people, you know, adhere to the dictates of your previous culture. Yeah. So, yeah, it's just... Uh, a couple more quick questions, because <laughs> I know we're pushed for time. Would a Biden or Trump administration next time round be better for the Western world? I mean, if someone put a gun to my head, I'd pick Trump. If there was a gun to my head, track record. You know, he, no war under his administration, and he brought in the Abraham Accords. Yeah. Well, I would be pretty happy with another four years of no war and an extension of the Abraham Accords. Does that mean that Trump would be my preferred candidate? No. Who would be? I don't know. I'm going to watch and see as things unfold. There's a new entrant into the Democrat race, Dean Phillips. Yes. I know Dean a little bit. Impressed Dean's quite a him. remarkable person. He's a, I think he's a good person. And I don't, mean, I don't mean that casually. I've had some fairly extensive conversations with Dean. He's, he's a remarkable person. And so we'll see where he goes. I saw the first Republican candidates debate. You know, it was actually a rather impressive slate. And so... I know that Mike Pence dropped out. Mike would have run, I think, a very administratively oriented administration. It would have been back to sort of politics as everyday business, which is really what you'd hope for if you had any sense. Um, Vivek Ramaswamy is extremely creative and entrepreneurial, very dynamic. I think it's very interesting to see him in the race. Nikki Haley, she's a tough cookie, yeah. and she's fun to watch. And so, you know, there's some promising candidates on that side now. Trump is. Trump's a formidable force, yeah. and at the moment, he certainly has the upper hand. But, and I'm not pleased with Biden for a variety of reasons, not least, and, and this is something particularly salient at the moment. The Saudis, I believe, and I have reason to believe this, I believe they would have signed the Abraham Accords two years ago yeah. if Biden would have been willing to give Trump some credit. And I believe the Democrats didn't pursue Saudi Arabia at that point because it would have been inconvenient to give Trump credit. And so they isolated and alienated him when they could have given him some credit. He might have just ridden off into the sunset if he'd got some credit for what he had done, but they turned him into the monster they needed to fumigate against, and now they have the monster back. And now we have the situation in Israel, yes. right, where Iran is using Hamas to agitate the Islamic world against Saudi Arabia, essentially, as far as I can tell, that's what's going on. Yes. So I'm not very happy with the Biden administration because of that. And I'm also not happy with the Democrat inability to deal with the woke left. You know, when, when the squad run by AOC was, was promoting the pro-Hamas demonstrations in New York, the White House spokeswoman did come out and denounce them. That was the first time in years, six years, and I've talked to many Democrats, where I actually saw the Democrats draw a line. I've asked 40 Democrats that I've talked to, some on my podcast, when does the left go too far? Not one of them would answer. 
Not one, not mm. even Robert Kennedy. Mm. He said, I'm not trying to run a divisive campaign. It's like, fair enough, you know, but you could draw a line between you and the communist psychopaths, yes. you know, so. <laughs> that would be a good start. Well, hey. Final you know. question, which of your 12 rules for life do you think is the most important? <laughs> Tell the truth or at least don't lie. Yeah, you know, if people are wondering, even people who, who labor under the burden of genuine oppression, if they're wondering what they can do to set the world right, one of the things you can do to set the world right that you could do is you could stop lying by your own judgment of what constitutes a lie. It's somewhat different than telling the truth, you know, because what do you know about the truth? The truth, that's hard, but you could cease to utter words you know to be false. and. By doing so, you would cease to tilt things towards hell, right? And that's actually quite the moral accomplishment, yes. and it has a much larger effect than you might think. I've talked to, literally, to thousands, particularly young men, but, but not only, thousands of, of young people around the world who've told me that they decided at some point in the last four or five years to stop lying, and that their lives entirely transformed. And they usually stay, say that in something like a state of shock, because many of them were in dismal and dreadful places and are doing so much better now that they actually can't believe it. So that's a lovely thing to see. Jordan Peterson, thank you very much for joining me. My pleasure. Thank you for inviting me. Thank you. Mm. Thank you, Peter Singh. Peter Sin, I just love reacting to his uh, um, talk shows. His um, when he's on, when he has interview, I like watching the video because he he's, he's very good. He's a good public speaker. Peter Sin, he's he's amazing. Like he's he's very very good. Being um, um, multicultural, Zin, like if like the society we are now, government are just putting new law new law new law we should abide to different different laws we should abide to it like to me they're just they're not just um helping us fix the other the old law that we have so i can be able to do everything right no they're just bringing new laws capturing the whole thing multicultural putting different cultures together different different, different things right now we have feminists right now we have um uh, um gays different you can change your sex to different sex of your choice you can uh, single mothers everywhere like different different uh, um things that's the reason why peter seems to love um jonah trump yeah he love him that he's he's very very good because he he talks about um good about christians he talks about our um coming to let being father into the home, like let family unite. It's not an easy thing to be a single mother, and it's not a bad thing to be a single mother. But I just want to say, some single mother out there today, if she or her husband, um, she and her husband just have some misunderstanding, oh no, I'm going to fire you to divorce. Why wow, you just go and divorce your husband because of something that you know you can easily settle. So I don't know why you go for divorce. Me to me, if you are a single, um, like you want to be a single mother, like what if you want to leave your husband? It should be maybe he's having a mental cycle, or maybe he's um, he's on drugs and it's not good for you or the kids. He's also maybe like acting, acting some way that you don't really understand, like something that is threatening life straighten i feel it's very good for you to divorce but when it's just one normal misunderstanding at home maybe maybe the man said something that you don't like you just go and divorce or this 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 no that's not right so right now the community the society is just pushing on single mother single mother single mother single no single mother is like i'm not judging them it's not like it's a bad thing but i just feel that some some when you go to court to so listen to divorce case you see that some case is not relevant like it's not, it's not good like to me the judge might just even say go and settle with your husband it's not something that is like that can lead to divorce you understand it's not something that can lead to divorce so i feel that um we should take correction 
if you want to be a female, if you want to be a male, because in olden days, we don't have uh, a female going to be a male, a male going to be a female. No, we don't have it then. Everything was right, girl and um, boys, that's all. We don't have um, different, 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 different uh, uh, um, people changing to different, different gender. No, we don't have that. So right now, society is just bringing different type of things into um, um, the country. Different type of things into multicultural. Like, to me, I feel that we should just do the right thing at the right time. We should just do the right thing. We should be able to work with what we have. Not something that you just go bigger something. People say, ah, oh, yeah, yeah, it's good. Yeah, let's, let's try it. It's good. Freedom of speech. Freedom of doing things. Freedom of... No. Before you do something, you check. You see, check and understand what and what. Is this good? Can this... Where will it lead me to? Not going to... Because they have regalized um, gay. They have regalized... Um, um, Changing your gender to different gender in America, that does not mean that you don't you don't think, okay, what if I'm going for surgery now and I die there? Have you thought about that? Okay, what if I remove my private part to another one and, and I was not able to give birth or I'm not able to... Have you thought about that? I know that some of them think about it, but sometimes feel up, think about the negative part of it. I feel that you should live your body the way God created you. It's very, very important. Very, very good. And you should just believe in, in, in God or in Allah. So I just, I just like the way Peter Zane answered all his questions in the right way. I just feel that many of us should watch this video because Peter Zane, he, he he's very, 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 very good. It's very, very good. Like, he's a good public speaker. He, he said the truth at always. He said the last, what he said last. He said, able to say the truth at any given time. It makes you bold. Talk. Relax. No one wants to ask a question. You just want to just talk lie or make, you f make them feel good. No. Say what you know is right. Do what you know is right. Say the truth at any given time, even if there is a gun to your head, able to speak the truth. They say truth will set you free at all times. So I feel that the government should look into all this, should look into it. it should, because if you check the rate of death in terms of gay and things, and it's too much. You sleeping with your fellow man in your anus. I didn't know you have anus cancer right now. Before you do things, you think about it. My life, is it safe? The pleasure now, out of pleasure, what next? Where are you going to? That's the thing you have to think about. Why are you going to after pleasure? It's not about pleasure, pleasure, pleasure. What, what next? Please comment below. Any video you want us to react to, comment below. And also, if you have, share your point on this video on the comment section. Like this video, subscribe to our YouTube channel, Enger Fashion Store. Fashion makes sense.